So let's break this anatomy down, this anatomy of Elizabethan costume down even further. Okay, it started with a corset. You see, this is very, very different, isn't it, to the um, busk. This is a corset. It does pull you in and it laces down the front. Thus, this corset belonged to Queen Elizabeth I. It's really the only garment of clothing we have left from her reign that she actually wore herself. Over that went your bum roll, but you'll see now it's sort of like um, a massive donut or a, a life jacket, isn't it? Or like one of those life rings that you throw in. It's a massive tube that goes around your hips. Over that, a farthingale, and then your gown. But look what's happening with the gown here. It's missing the front. You're going to meet a new piece of attire now. The stomacher. The stomacher, and here it is. This was a triangular separate garment that would be laced onto your gown and form the front. The stomacher would stay around for the next uh, uh, 200 years or so. Then you would have a standing collar and then later a ruff. A ruff. And then, and that's your standing collar, and then you would top it all off with a jaunty cap. But take a look at that silhouette. That really is something, isn't it? You can see how completely wide it is at the bottom, but yet quite slender and triangular at the top. But then that that enormous ruff, it really was all about opulence. The more crap you had on you, the more powerful you were, the more fashionable you were, and the richer you were. But this look wasn't just for the rich. Everybody adopted this silhouette. The middle class, the working class, it was all based on this silhouette. So get this in your mind because it is pure Elizabeth. And of course, Elizabeth herself had the widest farthingale, the biggest bum roll. But then later to the court, they had this very, very wide and round disc-like thing going on at the bottom half. But you could actually, you know, live your life without a farthingale if you were a servant or a milkmaid, for example. And yet, you would still have enough volume in your skirt to achieve this silhouette. Hair and headdresses. Well, at the beginning of the Elizabethan era, hair was natural. The ideal hair was red and kind of frizzy, because Elizabeth's hair was red and kind of frizzy, and people would um, curl their hair with heated tongs, and ideally dye it red with henna. Then wigs got in. Elizabeth started wearing wigs, so everybody started wearing wigs, quite fancy wigs that were bejeweled. And the headdresses that were worn, they kind of follow the form of the French, ho the French hood, except that they are heart-shaped. Everything was heart-shaped on the head in Elizabethan days, including natural hair. People would um, style their natural hair to take on this heart-shaped form, which they would then adorn with jewels and top it all off with a jaunty little hat because less was not more in the Elizabethan era. Men achieved that sort of heart-shaped uh, uh, look with their moustaches, these lovely elegant long moustaches and these little pointy beards. And they curled their hair too. Why? Because the Queen had curly hair. She was the dominant force. Everybody wanted to look like the Queen. For men, the whole thing was kind of feminized, which is why one of the big accessories for Elizabethan men was just one earring in the ear. So let's take a look at Elizabethan male attire. But listen, when I use the term Elizabethan at this point, I'm really talking about a trans-European look because, of course, England, because of Elizabeth, especially after her defeat over the Spanish, became the center of fashion. And as we saw in the Middle Ages, it was France. In the Quattrocento, it was Italy. Blah, blah, blah. During this era, Elizabethan fashion was trans-European. So let's take a look at male attire. It's actually quite easy. It starts off 
with your holes and your slops. What are your slops? These are short sort of leggings. Slops would eventually become underpants. Then your shirt. Why am I not calling it a chemise? Because England was the dominant culture. So we are using English words. The shirt. Then a busk, a sort of corset-like busk, actually, because it pulled men in at the waist. Why? To give them a more female silhouette, a more feminine silhouette, because of Elizabeth. Then stocks. This is something new. What are your stocks? Basically, they're sort of billowing shorts that come mid-thigh. Then the doublet, you know about the doublet. Then over the doublet, the jerkin, you know about the jerkin. Then you put on your boots and your ruff, just like the ladies. And men would wear a cute little cape, um, a short cape that would uh, be worn by the very fashionable jauntily, jauntily over one shoulder, and then quite a tall hat like this. Again, to uh, make this very sort of lean, slender, feminine silhouette. And this is what it looked like. You can see it really is extremely feminine, isn't it? The codpiece would eventually disappear because the stocks became so massive, but also during this period so short. These are called pumpkin hose. Remember I said that the upper hose and the stocks get linguistically mixed up, just to make things difficult for you guys. Pumpkin hose, also known as melon hose because of the, the shape of them. And look here, his pumpkin hose have become so short. They're like hot pants, aren't they? Basically just rolls of fabric. But I really want you to note how feminine this silhouette is. And I would like you also please to note the shape of the torsos. Here is an older gentleman. He hasn't gone for the uh, uber short pumpkin hose, but look at his torso. It's so weird. It's padded. He has a padded doublet and it has a name. It's called a peace cod belly. Why? It's so weird. Well, I think this peace cod belly, this puffed up triangulated shape, pulls the focus towards the penis. We're losing the cod piece. We still have to put attention on the penis somehow, right? Also, I think that it accentuated a small waist. Again, giving it that very ladylike silhouette. Here is another guy uh, with a piece cod belly, but I'm showing you him, not only so you can see the size of his massive ruff, but also I want you to note the detail, the detail on his outfit. Here it is up close, and it has a name. It's called pinking. Basically, pinking are all of these little slashes in a garment, but it's not slash and puff because nothing is pulled through. It's purely decorative and nothing is pulled through, just little slashes, pinking. And here are some modern interpretations of pinking. Let's look at what children wore during the Elizabethan era. Well, they dressed exactly as their parents did. I love these images. Look at that little boy in his high chair there holding his sister's hand. And look at this baby. No, they are not wearing um, uh, corsets beneath any of this, but they dressed as their parents parents did. There was no concept of clothing for children. In fact, there's not been a concept of clothing for children throughout any of the eras we're looking, looking at, um, and this will continue until the 19th century. I think uh, common sense dictates that when kids were just at home and running around and playing, they did not wear ruffs. They probably just wore, if they were a little girl, a kirtle. If they were a boy, they would wear a shirt and some hose obviously. But when they dressed up and they put their quote un unquote clothes on, they dressed exactly like their parents. Even tiny babies, all children, were swaddled. 
that means wrapping uh, fabric around them so they can't kick about and hurt themselves. But look at this little girl here, and you know it's a little girl because of a little headdress. Completely grown up. And you're thinking, oh, wow, that's so bizarre. But guess what? It's an idea we've gone back to. Look at this little guy. And look at this big guy. We, we are now dressing children like ourselves. Or maybe we're dressing like children. Look, they're wearing the same gear. They both have jeans on. They both have trainers. They both have t-shirts. They both have baseball caps. Look, here's a lady in a hoodie. Here's a baby in a hoodie. We dress our babies and our toddlers and our children like ourselves again. So it's really not that weird, is it? And of course, we have to talk about makeup. The Elizabethan era is known for this, this pasty white lead-based face makeup that was known as Venetian ceruse, or you can just call it ceruse. It was lead-based, meaning that it absolutely damaged and ruined your skin, which meant you just put more of it on, didn't you, to hide the blemishes. Now, ceruse would come back again in the 1700s, during the era of, let's just say, Marie Antoinette, because I know that you all know who she is. And the popular myth is that women in both the Elizabethan era and then men in the Rococo era of the 18th century whitened their faces to show that they were wealthy and that they didn't have to work outdoors on the farm. Um, hello, I think everybody knew Elizabeth I didn't have to work outdoors on a farm. This is a myth that people who truly don't know fashion history cough up every five minutes. This is not why people made their faces white. There were other reasons for it, and it depended which century you were looking at. The reason that faces became white like this with this Venetian ceruse I think you've probably figured it out. Elizabeth was a redhead with very pale skin to begin with. So she had a very Northern European look, a very English look. The enemy of England was Spain. And so during the Elizabethan era, I think the reason for Ceruz was to look as un-Spanish and as English as possible lovely pale white skin and red hair or fair hair like the English or oh, none of that olive toned skin that beautiful olive toned skin and black hair of the Spanish no it was patriotism in a way it became fashionable to look as English as possible and as much like Elizabeth as possible because hang on they didn't wear ceruz in Spain did they? They wore it in England. And uh, so this whole idea of, oh, yeah, oh, the rich wore the ceruse, so they didn't, they didn't, people knew they didn't work outside. That is utter nonsense. There were very political reasons for it. When ceruse came back in the 18th century, it was for entirely different reasons again. But those reasons weren't about showing that you didn't work on a farm either, because believe me, everybody knew that uh, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette didn't work on farms. But uh, Venetian ceruse was weird, and it made you look so completely bizarre. Also, there was this idea of having this, these very tiny little lips. Again, the English are not known for their full lips. So this was a way of accentuating this whole... Uh, sort of British Isles chic. And uh, this, is, uh, this is an image of the actress Glenda Jackson playing Queen Elizabeth I when she's very old. And um, I'll tell you what, Elizabeth piled this shit on when she was old. She put more ceruse on the older she got, and it ended up really looking kind of grotesque. But everybody did this. So, you know, this whole thing about people imitating Elizabeth, you're probably thinking, oh, my God, how sad were these people? OK, this is a portrait of Queen Elizabeth, and these are portraits of people who are not Queen Elizabeth. And you can see that they really are trying to get the Elizabeth look. 
Oh, how sad, how old-fashioned. Thank God we're not like that anymore. Wait. When Princess Diana first came onto the scene, everybody wanted to look like Diana. Look at this picture. These are girls who have gone and had a Lady Di haircut because they want to look like her. The press was full of it, how to get the Lady Di look. And believe me, I was around in the 80s. Everybody wanted the Lady Di look. Look, Di's beauty secrets is exactly the same as people wanting to imitate and uh, get fashion inspiration from Queen Elizabeth. But you know what? This isn't just an English thing in America in the early 1960s. Who's that? Oh, that's Jackie Kennedy. And believe me, everybody was imitating her look in one way or another. So this idea of uh, regular people taking their fashion lead from royals, from the rich, from the famous, is nothing new. Come on, how many people still want to look like Kim Kardashian?